In the last module, we focused on the market for labor, and in the previous module, we focused for the mar in, for, in the markets for the other factors of production, land and capital. So now we've looked at the markets for all of the factors of production, land, labor, and capital. And we've looked at how firms determined how, how firms determine how much of each input they want to use. But the problem that we haven't looked at yet is how they combine those inputs, because when firms make goods and services, they use land, labor, and capital. And they can uh, al use alternatives, you know, quantities of land or alternative quantities of capital to produce the same amount of a good. So they have to determine how much of each input they want to use. And obviously, firms are interested in minimizing their costs. So in this module, we're going to look at how firms determine the cost-minimizing input combination of those factors of production in order to improve the profits of their firms. So in this module I will explain how firms determine the optimal, optimal input mix and will apply something called the cost minimizing rule for employing inputs. We have studied how single inputs are hired to maximize profit and we saw that firms must employ an input up to the point where the marginal revenue product is equal to the marginal factor cost of that input. But what does a firm do when there are different ways in which to produce the same output? Firms combine inputs like labor, capital, and land to produce output. Construction is a great example. Carpenters use tools to build houses, but there are different combinations of labor and capital that will get, get the same house built. One man with a nail gun could be more productive than several men with hammers and nails. And the firm must decide if that more expensive but more productive nail gun is a better choice than several men using inexpensive hammers instead. Or if we think of George and Martha's wheat farm, you know, they could use a bunch of tractors and harvesters, capital, to harvest that wheat, or they could employ a bunch of laborers to do the same amount of work. Or they could employ a combination of capital and labor. So do they use more workers? Do they use more tractors? Do they use a combination of them? You know, because there are different ways and combinations of using these different inputs in order to get the same level of output. So you want to use the combination that is going to come at the least cost possible. So in many instances, a firm can choose among a number of alternative combinations of inputs that will produce that same given level of output. So, as in the examples I just gave with construction or a farm, the firm could choose a capital-intensive operation by hiring more capital than labor, or they could use a labor-intensive operation by hiring more labor than capital, and still get the same output. Th this picture here shows an ATM machine. I mean, should a bank use more a ATM machines to distribute cash, or should they use more tellers? Or should they use both? And if so, what combination of ATMs and tellers should they use? because one is capital and one is labor. So there are all these different combinations, and so they want the input combinations that will give them the least cost possible, and that will lead us to the cost-minimizing rule for inputs for factors of production. Now, the concept of complements and substitutes, we looked at it with respect to demand and supply of goods and services. But it also applies to a firm's purchase of inputs. Substitute inputs can be used in place of each other. Those are two factors that can do essentially the same work. So examples might be the ATM machine, example I just gave you, that dispenses cash, accepts deposits, and allows you to transfer money. The ability to perform these banking tasks makes the machine a substitute for a bank teller who could do the same thing. A caterpillar backhoe with one driver can dig holes and ditches. But all, a team of men with shovels, or a team of students even with spoons, can also dig holes and ditches. So these are also substitutes in production. Two types of labor can also be substitutable. An American computer programmer and a Korean programmer could do the same work. They can substitute for each other. A group of union auto workers in Indiana could be substitutable in producing cars with a group of non-union workers in Tennessee who could produce the same cars. So, firms have to choose which inputs they're going to use. Complement inputs exist when one input increases the productivity of the other. Two factors must be combined to produce the output. So the presence of one factor 
increases the marginal product of the other. An example might be the caterpillar backhoe and the driver are complements. In other words, you need both. You can have a caterpillar backhoe to do the work, but you need a human being to drive it. And if that human being has that caterpillar tractor, or that backhoe rather, they are going to be much more productive doing the work than if they didn't have the backhoe. So they are used together, and together they become more productive. Not much digging gets done if they aren't combined together in production. You need the driver and the backhoe. Or a team of pilots and a 747 passenger jet. They're complements. The jet isn't going anywhere without the pilots, and the pilots aren't going anywhere without the jet. They, they have to be used together. They're complementary inputs. But one is human labor, the jet is capital. An 18-wheeler and a truck driver are complements. Again, the truck driver doesn't go anywhere without the truck and the 18-wheeler, but the 18-wheeler can't go anywhere without the driver. So they go together, and the capital and labor work together. Can you brainstorm any examples on your own, from your own work experience, where both labor and capital are substitutable? In other words, labor replaces capital, or capital replaces labor, or where they are complementary. In other words, where they have to be used together to make production more efficient. So because of this, firms have to determine the optimal, optimal input mix. Okay? How do you decide which combination of inputs, land, labor, and capital, to use if the combinations provide the same amount of output? Okay. Well, you know, if, for example, in this picture of a store, you know, how does a store decide how many human cashiers they're going to hire and how many self-checkout units they are going to have? Okay. Um, that's a combination of capital and, and human labor. Well, how you do it is that you find the combination of inputs that costs the least. In other words, the cost-minimizing input combination. So if there are multiple ways to produce some output, like digging a ditch, then how does the firm know which one to choose? And this is what they will do. Okay. So how do we do cost minimization? That's the next thing that we have to look at. Suppose a city needs to dig a 100-foot drainage ditch, and the city hires Doors Ditch Diggers, we'll call that DDD for the job, and DDD has been exper experimenting with two combinations of labor and capital that can each get the ditch dug in the same amount of time. Combination one is that they rent a backhoe and they hire a skilled driver. Combination two is that they hire ten unskilled workers and give each of them a shovel. So the table here summarizes the costs of employing these two combinations, and you can see them on your screen. Clearly, the low-tech way of digging ditches is preferred. Why? Because it only costs them $1,250. Combination one would cost them $3,000. So clearly they would choose combination two, with men and shovels. However, what if DDD underestimated the productivity of the backhoe and driver, and it was discovered that combination one could actually produce a drainage ditch 300 feet long in the same amount of time the men and shovels could produce a ditch only 100 feet long? If we factor in this difference in productivity, Combination 1 can produce 300 feet at a cost of $3,000. Combination 2 can produce 300 feet at a cost of 3 times 1250 or $3,750. So combination 2 would actually be more expensive for producing the same amount of feet of ditch. So the point so given the difference in productivity then DDD should hire combination 1 rather than combination 2. The point here is that not only should the firm consider the prices of labor and capital, but also their relative productivity and before choosing the combination of inputs that produces output at the lowest possible cost. Now, here's a tip for the AP exam. Employers will hire a factor of production only up to the point at which the marginal factor cost is equal to the marginal re re revenue product. Does that sound familiar? This is very similar to the principle you learned in the product market, right? When we talked about the product market, we said that production will only occur up until the point where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. 
right? If marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost, then you keep producing because it's adding to your profit. Once marginal cost is greater than marginal revenue, you stop producing because that takes away from your profit. So profit is greatest where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. Well, here we're basically looking at the same thing. Marginal cost is marginal factor cost, or the marginal cost of the factor of production, be it land, labor, or capital. And marginal revenue product is really the same thing as marginal revenue. In other words, it's the amount of revenue that is being produced by that factor of production, the additional revenue that that factor of production is producing based on how much it produces. And so if the marginal factor cost is greater than the marginal revenue product, then more money is going out than coming in by hiring that factor of production and you won't do it. But if the marginal revenue product is greater than the marginal factor cost, then that factor of production is bringing in more revenue than it's costing you for that factor. And so you will continue using more of it. And so the point where you would maximize that is where the marginal factor cost is equal to the marginal revenue product. So it's very similar to what we learned in the product market. Here's this example using cashiers and self-checkout stations. You know, if you look at the, uh, the checkout stations, here you would see, well, if the rental rate of a checkout station is $1,000 per month, then if, if, you, uh, if it's $1,000 per month and you have 20 of them, then you have to say, well, what is each station costing me per month? If you have 10 of them, it's costing you $100 per month. If, it, if you have 20 of them, it's costing you $50 right, per station. Um, the wage rate, if you pay workers $1,600 a month, then if you hire 10 workers, it's $160 per cashier. If you hire four workers, that's $400 uh, per cashier. So you have to look at these various combinations. The, so for capital, remember the price of capital we call the rental rate, and that would be true for land as well. So land and capital, their price is called the rental rate. Um, the factor that is labor, we call it the wage rate. So if the cost to rent, operate, and maintain a self-checkout station for a month is $1,000 and hiring a cashier is $1,600 per month, then we can calculate the cost of each input this way. The cost of capital in, in those two... Um, in, in, for example, A, rather, it, you know, you'd have 20 um, self-checkout stations at $1,000 each, that would be $20,000, or you would hire four laborers at $1,600 each, and that would be $6,400. So if you use that combination of labor and capital, 20 checkout stations, and you hire four workers, it will cost you $26,400 a month to do that. But if you use the other combination, 10 checkout stations, and you hire 10 cashiers, that will cost you $26,000, as you can see here. Um, so, which is cheaper? Well, combination B is cheaper. So, in this case, the firm would hire 10 workers, and they would use 10 checkout stations. Now, remember the rule that a consumer follows. When we looked at the marginal utility that a consumer uses to maximize their utility um, using their budget constraint. When we studied consumer choice in Unit 3, we found that utility was maximized when the ratio of marginal utility per dollar was equal for each good. In other words, when a consumer is choosing what combination of goods and services to purchase to maximize their utility, they purchase that, the combination of goods and services where the marginal utility for one good divided by its price is equal to the marginal utility of the other good divided by its price, which is equal to the marginal utility of all those goods divided by their price. In other words, marginal utility per, per dollar has to be equal for each good and service. That was the utility maximization rule. Well, in a similar way, this is true when firms determine the combination of inputs that they are going to hire for the cost minimization rule. We have, we have a firm that wants to minimize the cost of hiring inputs, labor and capital, to produce as much output as possible. So employing labor and capital requires paying factor prices the, that are called the wage to labor and the rental rate for labor and capital. 
and each provides output to the firm, the marginal product of labor and capital. The firm will find that at any level of output, that at any level of output is produced at the lowest cost when labor and capital are hired such that the marginal product of labor divided by the wage is equal to the marginal product of capital divided by the rental rate. So the results from hiring an additional unit of an input is the marginal product of that input, and firms want the highest possible marginal product from each dollar they spend on each input. So firms will adjust their hiring of inputs until the marginal product per dollar is equal for all inputs. So the rule, the cost minimizing rule, looks like this. The marginal product of labor divided by the wage has to be equal to the marginal product of capital divided by the rental rate. Or if this was land, the marginal product of land divided by the rental rate. In other words, they have to be equal. So it's basically saying that the marginal product per dollar for one has to be equal to the marginal product per dollar of the other one. Because if one is greater, if the marginal product per dollar for one is greater than the other one, then you want to hire more of the one for which it is greater and less of the other one that is less. So this is the cost minimizing rule. Okay. Now, let's look at a couple of scenarios. What if that rule isn't true? Okay. What if the marginal product of labor divided by the wage is not equal to the marginal product of capital divided by the rental rate. What if one of them is greater than the other one? Well, let's look at two scenarios. In the first scenario, suppose the firm has hired labor to the point where the marginal product of labor equals 50 and capital to the point where the marginal product of capital equals 40. Well, the marginal product of labor divided by the wage would equal 50 units per dollar, meaning that we're, from labor, we're getting 50 units of output for every dollar we spend on labor. From capital, we're only getting 20 units of output for every dollar we spend. So we know that the marginal product of labor divided by the wage is greater than the marginal cap product of capital divided by the rental rate. In other words, we're getting more from our labor, more output from our labor for each dollar we spend than we are for each dollar we spend on capital. So what does that tell us? Well, that tells us then that we should spend more on hiring labor. Why? Because as we do that, the law of diminishing returns tells us that the marginal product of labor will, will start coming down as we hire more labor. And capital, which we're getting less for from each dollar, as we hire less of it, the marginal returns will increase. So if the marginal product of labor as we hire more labor is decreasing and the marginal product of capital as we use less of it is increasing, we keep using more labor and less capital until they are equal to each other. And once they are equal to each other, then we know we have provided the least cost possible. So if the firm takes $2 away from hiring a unit of capital, it could hire two more units of labor. Total costs would remain the same, but how would this affect production? Lost production from one less unit of capital equals approximately 40 units. Gained production from two more units of labor equals a little less than 100 units. So the firm would see more production at the same cost. That's a great deal. So it seems reasonable to think that the firm would continue to hire more labor, which causes the marginal product of labor to decline, and less capital, which causes the marginal product of capital to rise, until output can no longer rise. And that would be where the marginal product of labor divided by the wage is equal to the marginal product of capital divided by the rental rate. Or we could say where the marginal product of labor per dollar of labor is equal to the marginal product of capital per dollar. Scenario two, suppose the firm has hired labor to the point where the marginal product of labor is 10 and capital to the point where the marginal product of capital is 60. So now we're looking at the opposite scenario where capital seems to be more productive than labor. 
For every dollar we spend on labor, we're getting 10 units of output. For every dollar we spend on capital, we're getting 30 units of output. So we're clearly getting more for every dollar we spend from capital than we are from labor. So this tells us that we should hire more capital, use more capital, spend more on capital, and spend less on labor. If the firm takes two dollars away from hiring two units of labor, it could hire one more unit, or, or two, if it takes two dollars away from hiring two units of labor, it could hire one more unit of capital. Total costs would remain the same, but how would this affect production? Well, lost production from two fewer units of labor would lose us 20 units, but gained production from one more unit of capital would give us another 60 units. So we lose 20, gain 60. So the firm would see more production at the same cost. That, again, is a great deal. So it seems reasonable to think that the firm would continue to hire more capital, and as they do that, the marginal product of capital will be declining. As they hire less labor, the marginal product of labor will rise until output can no longer rise, and the marginal product of labor divided by the wage is equal to the marginal product of capital divided by the rental rate. And so the marginal product per dollar spent on labor will be equal to the marginal product per dollar spent on capital. And that's the least cost-minimizing output rule in both of these scenarios. So anytime the marginal product per dollar is not equal, the firm can reshuffle employment of labor and capital, hiring more labor and less capital or more capital and less labor to increase output while keeping costs unchanged. And once the firm has found the least cost combination of labor and capital, the firm has found the combination of inputs that produces that output at the lowest possible cost. And that is the cost minimizing rule, where the marginal product of labor divided by the wage is equal to the marginal product of capital or land divided by the rental rate. And so the cost-minimizing rule for the, determining the proper combination of inputs to use in the production of goods and services looks very similar to the, the, um, the utility maximization rule that consumers use to determine the combination of goods and services that will maximize their utility. So... Definitely, you should know the cost minimi minimization rule for the AP exam, how to use it, how to calculate it. And remember, if you're asked to calculate the least cost combination of goods, you're not going to have a calculator with you. You have to be able to work this out on paper on your own. But the numbers that they give you will be easy to work with. They're not going to give you complicated numbers that make for difficult math. They'll be easy to work with, but you have to know what the formula is and how to use it and how to determine that proper combination of inputs. So, again, reviewing what we just learned, if the marginal product of labor divided by the wage is greater than the marginal product of capital divided by the rental rate, then the firm could move a dollar from hiring capital into hiring labor and get more output from it at the same cost. So the firm then would continue to substitute labor for capital until the falling marginal product of labor per dollar meets the rising marginal product of capital per dollar. And, likewise, if the marginal product of labor divided by the wage was less than the marginal product of capital divided by the rental rate, then the firm could move a dollar from hiring labor into hiring more capital and get more output from it at the same cost. So the firm will continue to substitute capital in place of labor until the falling mar marginal product of capital per dollar meets the rising marginal product of labor per dollar. Here's an activity practice activity we'll do in class on cost minimization. And here is the summary for this module. And this concludes our look at Module 72, the cost-minimizing input combination.